Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Exploring UI UX with Diego Salazar. So without any further ado, I'm going to give it straight to him to kick it off, and I'll just be here to answer questions as you proceed. Take it away. Go ahead, Diego. Thanks, Justin. Uh, as he said, my name is Diego Salazar. Some of the people in the Monero community know me as Rarar. Um, kind of my day job, I own a small design firm, and I'm particularly interested uh, in UI UX. Uh, it's something that I, I like. Um, I like the science behind it. I like the art behind it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and it's something that I want to work on kind of with, with open source in general, because that's a place where it generally lacks. So um, for those of you who maybe just be watching this video just because you clicked on it or something, there was a first video that I would recommend you go watch beforehand. And that's kind of where we talk about UI UX in general, uh, what it is, um, <clears throat> what are the skills that people need in order to um, be effective at working on it. and. Um, you know, we kind of looked at kind of real life ways that UI UX presents itself and just everyday things, you know, with doors, with teapots, with all these things, everything has a user experience behind it. So um, please, by all means, go watch that video and come back to this one after you've done that, because that's a, a broad framework that we're going to be working off of today. <clears throat> so today in particular, we're going to be focusing on technology and open source. And so kind of this whole user interface and user experience thing really kicked off the ground after tech, you know, with the, with the rise of technology. Um, but as alluded to in the previous video, it's been a thing for a long time, just with everything that we use, but it really has become quite formalized. Um, and a lot of effort has gone into understanding it from a psychological level, from a sociological level, a lot of research, um, a lot of money spent by companies to try to understand what drives people, um, especially as technology has become ubiquitous. Everybody not only has a computer, which that was a really big milestone, you know, when computers came to be, now all of a sudden everybody's got a screen. But then once we got, when, once we moved over to cell phones and now not, not only does everyone have a screen, everyone has a screen that they carry with them everywhere they go. So now the ability for companies, corporations, foundations, all these different uh, entities that want your attention, um, they have this, this kind of personal way to get to you if you approve them. So really it's getting that foot in the door in the beginning is very important to them getting that foot in the door because now they're on your phone you know now they have access um now the only thing they have to do is keep you there and how they keep you there is through the interface and user experience so getting you there that's kind of what marketing is you know that's kind of making you aware that this thing exists and you're like yeah i'll give that a shot i'll try that out you go and put that on your phone you put that on your computer any of these things um but keeping you so you don't just uninstall like ugh, man this was an awful experience which i have done several times I, i'm sure many of you have too you can imagine you download something onto your computer because you want to do something or you download something onto your phone because you want to do something. And firstly, you go type in free way to do this thing. Uh, and then you find something on the Android Google Play Store or the, the App Store and you download it. And let's say it doesn't work or let's say there's too many ads or, you know, let's just say it's an annoying interface. You're like, you know what? I'll find another way to do this. And you just uninstall it. So they got their foot in the door by in this particular case, probably being one of the first ones or with a lot of reviews or something. And that's why I downloaded it to begin with. But the reason I got rid of it instead of using it and continuing to use it is because of a very bad interface, a very bad overall user experience. Um, so ex user experience is all about retaining people. And as we mentioned before, uh, it's, it's this idea of being intuitive and being a pleasure to use. Um, and I really actually want to delve into uh, a little bit, if, if you'll forgive me for getting a little uh, kind of personal philosophy, throwing that in there, um, which uh, I, it, those of you who know me know that I like to do that from time to time or all the time. I throw some of my personal philosophies in, into, into a lot of my work. Your show, so take it however you like. We have awesome. that more episodes. <laughs> awesome. Um, I, I think we're entering a day and age of just kind of user exhaustion or cynicism, especially with this upcoming um, generation of people who have never known a world without cell phones, because it's just, it's just this idea that if I really like chocolate chip pancakes, but I eat chocolate chip pancakes every single day for breakfast, like they start to lose their charm. They stop, they stop, they, they stop being special. 
And so with all of these apps, now all of these apps are not just trying to get your attention. They're trying to be a delight to use, a pleasure to use, right? If everything is delightful, absolutely everything in the world is just a delight to use, you know? At some point, it all kind of runs together. It become it just becomes the norm. It becomes the new standard. It's like, yeah, this is just the new normal, you know. So this upcoming generation where everything is smooth and easy, and um, you don't have to think about anything. You just know what to do automatically. Like, um, this is what they're going to expect. And anything less than excellence, absolute excellence, is they're just not even going to try. They're just not going to deal with it. Um, and some people might say, well, you know, my generation, that's when you know when you're getting old, by the way, in my generation, you're like we, we, we stuck through it and we read the manuals and we did all these things. And, um, you know, there's something to be said for both sides of the argument. But uh, as, as I have said before and, and commonly say about user experience, just like life is too short, man. Life is too short to be battling constantly with applications. Life is too short to be battling constantly with these things. Like these are, if I spend five minutes tr wrestling with an application to get it to do what I want it to do, those are five minutes that I could have spent, you know, hanging out with my wife, five minutes that I could have spent going for a run or exercising or, and, and when you add up all of these five minutes cumulatively over a person's lifetime that you spend wrestling with something, trying to get it to do what you want it to do, uh, it ends up to be hours, maybe days, maybe weeks of people's lives that are just gone. And, you know, life's too short to mess with this kind of stuff. So kind of my goal in Monero is as we, is we really want to make Monero excellent to use and, and kind of reach that new norm of delight. Um, because we want everyone to have access to this free money, but we don't, um, people's time is as important as people's money. And I think we need to respect their money as much as uh, their time, as much as we're trying to respect their money. Um, and we do that by having good user experiences. So we're going to move on. Sorry for that little aside. Uh, we're going to move and we're going to spend the majority of this talk talking about goals. Um, because user experience is all about goals. In fact, if you try to plot out kind of an interface or like what, what, um, what your application is going to look like or what it's going to do before you have an idea of who your users are and what their goals are going to be, you're setting yourself up for failure right away. You know, um, and you, this work, this is true. If you're starting a business, this is true. If you're writing a book, if you're making a video game, whatever the case may be, whatever it is you're trying to do, if you don't know who your audience is and you don't know what they're going to try to accomplish, you're really just going to waste your time and everybody's going to be frustrated. You're going to be frustrated as the creator that nobody likes it. They're going to be frustrated because they expected it to do one thing and it didn't do that thing or it didn't do it well. So the first thing you have to do is define goals. What is my audience and what are they trying to accomplish? Every time I open an application, every single time I have a goal, every single time. If I want to um, check my email, I click on the email. If I use an email client, if I use a browser base, whatever the, the case might be, every time I click on that and open the application, my goal is to check my email. And several things can frustrate that goal. If my internet connection is not doing very good, so it's taking the emails a long time to load or to download, and it's, you know, uh, waiting, 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 waiting. Okay, finally, you know, finally I can access my emails. Um, this wasn't necessarily the fault of the application; it was a fault of my internet connection. But that plays a role uh, in in my experience of accomplishing my goals. And in some cases, uh, like I've used. <laughs> I, I'm not going to call companies out by name. Uh, I have used some email um, browser-based email clients that either the search function takes forever to work or it doesn't work very well at all. And I think people like Google have set a standard because most people are used to Gmail and it just works and it's fast. And you, this wasn't always the case. And it isn't the case with everything that is, that is currently out there. Um, but my goal is to check my email and that's all I care about as a user. I don't care about anything else other than my goals. And this is what people have to understand. If somebody is opening Monero, if somebody's opening and opening any other application, all they want to do is do what they want to do. They don't want to do anything else. And a lot of people try to put all these little other add-ons and we're going to get to, um, alternative incentives to user goals here pretty soon. But it, I just really trying to hammer in this point. Goals are absolutely everything and nobody opens up any sort of application with no goal in mind. I think the closest we get to that is when somebody is bored and they opened up a social media app just because there's nothing else to do. But even then they're accomplishing a goal of keeping themselves entertained. 
because they're bored. They're trying to solve their entertainment. So they have a goal and it's not necessarily to check what their friends are up to on social media. It's to entertain themselves. It's to get away from these dark foreboding thoughts that we're all just floating around aimlessly in this miserable existence. So there is a, there is a goal. There is a goal in mind here. And so actually when you look at uh, the way that these social media sites kind of set themselves up, you know, a lot of them have moved to this infinite scroll model where you just scroll and scroll and it never ends. Because if it does end and there's a button that says load more, well, at th that point, I'm thinking to myself, should I load more? Should I load more or should I go do something else? Whereas if I'm never presented with that option, I could just keep scrolling forever. And so this is actually a really nice segue into this idea that user goals by and large, because companies make applications and companies want like money and they want to make money, user goals are not the only things that are taken into account. Company goals are also taken into account. They have a, a monetization model. They have a business model. For some people, it's kind of a one and done thing, right? You purchase their software and you're good. For some people, it's a software as a service. You got to pay monthly. And so their whole thing is, well, we got to keep them here, subscribe, because otherwise they're just going to leave. Um, or make it as difficult as possible to unsubscribe from our service, um, which is called a dark pattern when you make the interface intentionally obtuse and frustrating just so people will give up and they, they won't unsubscribe because it's not worth the hassle. Um, but then also you look at things like mobile, um, mobile applications uh, that are very commonly used, things like YouTube. What is YouTube's goal? Their goal is to show you advertisements, right? If they do it too heavily, if they lean into it way too hard, then you're just not going to use YouTube because all you see is advertisements. But so, so they're trying to balance the user goals, which is to watch videos, to be entertained with the company goals of showing advertisements. And this is what you're going to find on almost every single company out there is that there is a company goal, which typically relies on their monetization model because they want to make money. And they balance that out with user goals. If you lean too heavily into the company goals and don't pay enough to the user goals, then the users aren't going to use it because it's not going to meet their needs and it's going to be too frustrating to use. But on the flip side, if you pay way too much attention to the user goals and your monetization model is not very thought out or you don't lean too heavily enough into it, you're going to find that you're not making enough money, um, which some people might say is not necessarily a bad thing because I'm a user and I don't necessarily care about if company XYZ um, goes out of business or not, especially since in this day and age where there is multiple platforms for everything I might want to do, I could just easily jump ship to another. But for the business, it obviously makes a big deal for them if they're about to go out of business or not. So they they do a lot of testing in terms of, okay, um, in, in terms of YouTube, I don't know if you've noticed this, but recently um, they've kind of done this thing. Well, let's try putting two advertisements in front of videos instead of just one. And you'll see add one of two. Um, I don't know how much everybody here watches YouTube, but that 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 is that is a thing where they're like, okay, our goal is to put advertisements in front of eyeballs. So we have successfully put advertisements so far. Let's try to push that a little bit more. And they gauge the backlash. They gauge, can we get away with this? Um, and if they can't, then they'll go ahead and roll it back. But if they can, then they'll just leave it like that. And who knows, maybe one day we'll see advertisement one of 10 and it'll just become the next TV. Because if you look at TV, once again, their their business model is advertisements. So they make a show and they separate the show into three or four segments, followed by, you know, five minutes of advertisements in between the segments. Um, and this is where I think open source really, really has the opportunity to shine and why it is such a pity for me, why the user experience of open source is so bad. Um, it has the potential to have the best user experience out there period, because open source is not concerned with company goals because there is no company most of the time. Some of the time there is, right? Some of the time there is. Um, but open source is all about, you know, giving to the users and, and there's only one set of goals in mind, the user, the user's goals. That's all we're really caring about here with open source. I'm going to interrupt you very briefly, just to uh -huh. first of all summarize to say that You've probably heard the word goals many times during this, this conversation so far, but it's about with traditional software trying to sell someone, it's about managing, having consumers really enjoy using the app and of course getting what you want out of them. There's the two parts. For open source, I'm gonna push back a little bit though and say that even though you're not trying to monetize them necessarily, I mean, some might, open source projects do try and monetize for the users, others don't. But in Monero's case, open source software needs to encourage people to use it, let's say, 
in the way that's best for the network. Right, and, and we're, we're, we're going to get there for sure. Um, because the, so here, yeah, we'll be finished on this train of thought because then in the very next section, we're going to talk about what happens when um, corporate goals are antithetical to user goals. So they actually go against each other. Um, but in, in this particular case, you, yeah, just kind of setting a foundation here, open source is mostly just concerned with user goals and doesn't have any company or corporate goals behind it. And so there's no balancing act that has to be played here. Um, so it has the potential in theory to have the best user experience in the world because it's not trying to compromise anything. Because I think everybody would agree if I'm watching a YouTube video and halfway through, it stops to show me an ad. It's something that I tolerate. It's something that I live through. It's not something that I'm thrilled about. And so you, um, the user experience of open source doesn't have to make this balancing act of how do we be just not annoying enough to make the person stay on our application so we can continue to make money off of them. It's asking a very different question. It's, it's not saying how can we be just not annoying enough? It's like, how can we thrill the user with like no no ifs, ands, buts, or anything like that. It has the potential to be the purest in terms of user experience, but it really isn't. It's really not. And a lot of this we talked about last time, it comes down to money because there's a lot of ways to test user experience. Is it good? Is it bad? And open source, <laughs> it doesn't have businesses, but it also doesn't have money. So um, though, even though it has the potential to be the best of the best in this area, um, realistically and practically, it doesn't have the resources to do so. But um, I also think that is an issue with the fact that there aren't as many designers in the space as um, coders, just because coders can just make something, you know, they make something happen and great for them. Um, but there's not enough designers willing to donate their time uh, to make these things better because they, they will come in with a different kind of inherent knowledge about how to take these things that the developers have made and make it so that way it's a pleasure to use without having to make this balancing act or compromise. And actually, as, as, a, as a designer, this is one of the uh, refreshing things for me about open source is, is I'm not having to do this balancing act. I'm, I can just ask the questions, how can we help the user here? Um, so as I said before, the next thing we're kind of moving into is this idea that Oftentimes, we will find that company interests and user interests are not the same thing. And this was true. I think this has kind of been true always. Their goal is to take your money at the end of the day. Your goal is to save as much money as possible to, to expend the least amount of money and get the best deal. Uh, so that way you have more money to spend on other things. And if you want to know more, you can go learn about economics because that's what this whole thing is all about, right? Um, Everything from supply and demand to markets, just people have different goals and they are often in opposition to each other. But this has um, really come to a head. And I, I alluded to this near the start of this video. Uh, users are at one of the strongest positions they could ever be at this point in time. Just because we are spoiled for options. You know, back in the day, uh, I had the TV and if I didn't have cable, you know, I had a small set of channels. And if I had cable, I had a slightly larger set of channels. In this day and age, we have an almost infinite amount of channels if you just go to YouTube or any of these other things. And um, heck, you don't even have to go to YouTube. You know, it's by and large the biggest one. But if you don't like YouTube and what they do, they, we have other ways of hosting videos that are, you know, some of them are also corporate like Vimeo, but some of them are open source. And you have the ability to have a federated uh, little open source video server type thing, which we have looked into the, for Monero for the past. And um, that is still kind of in the cards, but we'll, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll leave that there for now. Uh, users are in a very powerful position that we have not been in kind of, um, I think, ever, just because the onus is on the businesses to win us over. Because if I need an application that can simply count something, as in I just press the button, count, 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 like the little clicker thingies, um, and one of them has 50 million ads, I can go find another that doesn't have 50 million ads because I guarantee you there's going to be another one there whether it's on my phone or whether it's on a browser or whatever the case may be. We had just have so much power to just leave, to just go. And businesses are, are realizing that the amount of value they have to bring to the table for a person's entertainment or time or uh, whatever it is, whatever the goal is of the user to get there, um, that, like it, it really needs to just be stellar. It really needs to be next level. And 
<laughs> this is when cryptocurrencies are starting to enter the market. And we see that this is the case for cryptocurrencies as well. Um, I, I would say at this point in time, at time of recording, there is not another cryptocurrency similar to Monero that is as high up and well-respected as it is that it has committed to on by default mandatory privacy. So in this particular sense, I would say um, Monero does not yet have a, uh, a good thing to jump ship if you don't like the way Monero does things. Um, but, you know, you look at uh, Litecoin, you look at all these other coins that are just Bitcoin clones. Like if you don't like the way one of them works, if you don't like the glasses that one of the developers of one of them wears, you could just easily move someplace else, become a part of another community. Um, and I would say this is also the same with open source. If you're a developer or a designer and you are mistreated in whatever project you're trying to contribute to, you know what? You don't have to work on this project. You could just jump ship and go find another thing that is inside of your specialty. And maybe it's a thematic specialty like networking, or maybe it's a, uh, a language specialty like Java or, or C++. You just go find another project that will appreciate your work and you just go work there. Like nobody's forcing you to, to, to work there. We are just so, so spoiled for options. And I really think that open source is dropping the ball in terms of user experience with this new generation, with this new um, world of, of spoiled for options in mind. Because even if we do have the thing, this is free, this is free. Um, it's not necessarily easy to use. And when we really start honing in on Monero and how it is good, it is private, it is free, it's it's freedom, money, whatever we like to say. But if it's not easy to use, we, we really don't understand how much people take for granted good user experience these days. It's just the norm. It's just the way that it is. So um, I want to take a little bit of time and talk about cryptocurrencies and kind of uh, I'm going to just briefly touch on it and we'll get into it more in the next episode where we'll talk about cryptocurrency user experience and Monero user experience because cryptocurrency has some very interesting UX quirks that we have to work around just like with the private keys and stuff, right? Um, and Monero has things in addition to that just because the privacy technologies bring um, a level of, you know, you can't just look at the chain and see how much somebody has, which means it's not that easy to make a light wallet, right? You have to scan the whole chain uh, just because you can't easily tell what, what something is and what something isn't, which, what does that mean on the UX side? What that means is waiting. Instead of just getting an instantaneous number, we have to wait for the chain to verify and um, to, to show me my balance. And that waiting time, depending on uh, computer speed, can be a lot or a little. So those are some of the examples we're going to get into um, next time, because Monero has quite a bit of those. And Bitcoin um, and other cryptocurrencies as well have, have quite a bit of those. Um, but some of the things that are common to both kind of old technology and Bitcoin is this idea of private keys. And this is the one I really want to sink my teeth into here because this is probably the biggest, biggest one. Um, and it's so big that I'm going to spend a, a good chunk of time on this right now because I don't think there, there's too much to talk about in the, in the next episode. Um, private keys is probably the biggest thing for users. You know, for developers, there's a lot of things you have to consider. You have to consider the cryptography that you're using. You have to consider uh, management and networking and how things find each other. The users, hopefully, <laughs> if your cryptocurrency is built good enough, the user, the user themselves will never have to um, manually find peers to download the blockchain. It does that all for you. You know, that's a part of the user experience. And it, open source even knows that much, right? <laughs> users will not do that. Um, but so the private keys are the absolute biggest thing for the user. If they are lost, your money is lost. If they are stolen, your money is stolen. And if you have them, then you sit, then you have your, your, your cryptocurrencies, even if your computer goes away or, um, you know, you lose it on your phone. If you have that seed, if you have that private key, then, um, then you have your, you have your money, but how, I mean, people as a whole are not good at, at, information security. How do they secure these private keys? Um, you know, my grandmother is not going to be able to take this private key and secure it well. She doesn't know her way around technology that well. How do we make sure that everybody can do this securely? And 
what tools currently exist, what resources currently exist that make this not only a not sucky user experience, but an easy one, a delight that you can go ahead and, and, and secure these and know that you're safe. I, I wouldn't say that uh, we have much of anything. We have some pretty good stuff, like you can use a password manager to store this kind of information. Um, which is about as easy as we get. But it's interesting to note that this is not a new problem. You know, public private key pair cryptography has been around for quite some time and is used in, uh, oh, what is that thing where you sign all of the stuff with, what is that called, Justin, tell me. Remember where you sign the binaries and you can sign, make signatures and send messages, encrypted messages. PGP, that's the one, PGP. It works in the same way, right? Because you prop, you say, this is my fingerprint, this is, which is a representation of my public key. You give it out to everybody, but oops, I lost. I lost my fingerprint. I mean, I lost, I lost my private key. So now everybody has my fingerprint, but I can never send them a message with this private key because I've lost it. Or if it's stolen, then somebody can sign messages and it would validate. And says, they say, yes, this comes from Diego. I'm like, no, 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 this didn't come from me. My thing was stolen. So I have to rotate keys off in. And um, th this is just a nightmare when it comes to user experience. And there, there's plenty written, if you'll go online, there is plenty written about the user experience of PGP or G GPG um, and, and how bad it is. And really that's one of the major reasons why it never took off. It is one of the biggest reasons why it was like, okay, this is gonna be great. This is how we're gonna encrypt everything. This is how we're gonna do everything, but it never took off. And to this day, there's only a handful of people that consistently use it. And there's very funny anecdotes of where even the, some, the, the creator of it um, received a message that was encrypted. And he said, can you please send this to me in plain text over email? I am traveling right now and my phone does not have my keys on it. Um, it's, just, it's just a nightmare to use. And if we are not careful, and if we are not um, diligent about improving user experience, I fear that it's very easy for something like Monero to just fall in the same, the same way. You know, um, Monero is a very powerful tool, but if we don't make it so that way it's easy for people to use, it's never going to see the kind of adoption that, that we see, um, that we want, that we want to see. Sorry. This is a future that I want to help prevent happening. And I, I hope everybody else does too. And you'll hear this often from the scrubs. They'll say things like, well, yes, you know, good, good interfaces and good user experiences um, are, are the key to mass adoption or the key to this and that. Um, and I, I would say that Monero has done many things right in that first we get the foundations correct and then we work on the user experience because um, user experiences can be changed. Interfaces can be swapped out um, many times not easily and many times with great frustration to the users, but they can be changed. But foundations and plumbing cannot. I, I gave a talk at DEF CON, which is available on this Monero community channel, where I talk specifically about that. And so you can go ahead and, and walk, watch that if you want a little bit more uh, information, just, just kind of about the whole plumbing and toilet analogy, which, which I thought was pretty fun. Um, but yeah, so we're wrapping up here. Go, to go ahead and close us off, I just want to summarize everything that we've discussed so far, where user experience is primarily about goals. It's primarily about what people want to do. And in the, in the normal business sector, these goals have to be balanced with business goals. Um, in open source, we see a very strange thing where the business goals are not there because the businesses mostly are not there. Um, so open source has this potential to be a, a very kind of to kind of lead the way in terms of user experience to, to kind of uh, try some new things and and um, be a trailblazer in this area. But it really has not as of yet, which is a little disappointing. And it's especially disappointing because in the cases where user goals and um, company goals kind of go against each other, um, Typically, it has swayed in the company's favor, but we're, we're coming upon this new generation where uh, people can just jump ship and go to whatever they want. And that's the same case with cryptocurrencies. Um, so I think that's about all content that I have for this time. And if these past two have seemed a little uh, jumpy, I, I do apologize. I'm trying, to, I'm trying my best to summarize uh, many, 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 many uh, articles, months of research, uh, classes of user experience into uh, uh, digestible two videos 
So next video, we're really going to sink our teeth into the meat. We're going to put all these things to the test when we start talking about some really, really specific, not vague um, examples of, of UX in our real world or in technology, but very specific examples of where people get tripped up, what specifically needs improving. And I'm not necessarily going to give answers. I'm not going to necessarily say, and here's how I think we should fix this because I'm one person, I have a certain level of business savvy. And if I make what would work for me, um, if you remember, we talked about empathy last time and the ability to, to stand in somebody else's shoes and see what would work for them. Um, I can't just make solutions that would work for me or for my demographic or for people who would, uh, who have a similar level of tech savvy as myself. We really need to, uh, dig our, get our hands deep into the dirt and, and make sure that everybody knows this stuff and everybody uh, is going to be able to use this uh, without any issue. So we're going to look at very specific problems in cryptocurrency. And I say cryptocurrency, I mean Bitcoin, just because most everything kind of goes off of Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, Ethereum has its own stuff and at, maybe at some point in the future we can look at that. But we'll primarily focus on Bitcoin. And then we're going to dig deep into Monero and specific things that Monero needs to improve as an open discussion. And everyone is, is uh, able and um, hopefully willing to give their opinion on this. But yeah, I think that's about it. Oh no, Justin, you're muted. Sorry, I think my mouse is going in and out. Well, thank you, Diego, for covering a nice overview of what goals mean for users and the designers of the software. Note that they don't necessarily always lap up, uh, line up, but for open source, they should ideally line up more closely, as you pointed out. So there's a great opportunity here. I look forward to seeing what examples you're going to bring to the next show, sharing with with everyone else what shortcomings you found specifically, so we can, you know, be, feel them, so to speak. And um, are there any other final thoughts you want to give before I end the recording? Nope. Bye, everybody. Have nice lives. <laughs>